Assalamu alaikum. We are happy to have with us today Brother Abdul Rahim Green, formerly known as Anthony Green, who had reverted back to Islam in 1987 and has since then been actively involved in Islamic dawah work, the proper presentation and clarification about Islam, as well as removing misconceptions about Islam. He specializes in dealing more with contemporary issues and problems and challenges faced by Islam and Islamic perspective in the world. Since the last 10 years, he has regularly been a speaker at the Hyde Park's Speaker Corner and has been lecturing at the universities and colleges throughout UK and traveled widely all over the world at an international day of Islam. Brother Green, we would like this to be an interview in which we share with you your experiences, our Muslim brothers, as well as those who are taking an interest in knowing about Islam, get an insight into what actually it is becoming a person more aware and reverting to Islam, as well as what is the final objectives we look for in an Islamic life. Could you kindly give us a flashback of the events that made you come closer and get attracted to Islam and eventually reverting to Islam? Well, I think the best thing to do is tell you a little bit about my background first because it's relevant to the issue of how I came to Islam or the process that led to my uh, embracing Islam. Um, I came from uh, a quite well off uh, middle class English uh, background. Uh, my father was a banker and in fact he was, when I was about nine years old, he was sent to Egypt uh, in order to establish a, a branch of a particular bank anyway out there. So I, I spent my uh, childhood from when I was about nine years old. I used to go there for my holidays. But in fact my education took place in a very intensive religious environment in a uh, Roman Catholic monastic boarding school uh, called Ampleforth College. It's actually quite famous uh, in uh, the Roman Catholic uh, circles. So this, this was actually where I received my um, education in this uh, Roman Catholic monastic school. But I think my questioning about my, the religion of my upbringing um, began from a very early age. And my earliest memories were of my mother teaching me the, one of the very well-known prayers of the Roman Catholics. It's called Hail Mary. And the Hail Mary goes something like this. I can't remember exactly, but it goes something like this. Hail Mary, Mother of God, um, blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Anyway, we don't need to go into it. It was the first sentence of this uh, prayer that I used to think about. And it was Hail Mary, Mother of God. And I used to think, well, how can God have a mother? And even as a small child, I was thinking, how can God have a mother? God is supposed to be the infinite creator of the heavens and the earth without beginning and without end. So how could someone give birth to God? It was just incredible. And then I used to think, well, if Mary was the mother of God, she must be a greater God than God. I mean, we've all had mothers, obviously. <laughs> And we know how we look up to our mothers and we respect them. And I think all of us go through a stage in our life when we think that everything our mother says is the truth. And, you know, she knows everything. And um, so this idea that God had a mother was just absolutely incredible to me. How could someone give birth to God? It was a contradiction in terms. As I learned more and more about, um, you know, the basic theology of Christianity, which is common to Catholics, Protestants, and all denominations of Christians basically have the fundamental belief that Jesus is God and he's the son of God and that God is a trinity and that Jesus died for the sins of mankind. I mean, uh, whatever the other bits and pieces are, those are the basic fundamental teachings that are common. And it was these fundamental precepts that I had problems with, the trinity, for example. How was it that God was one God and God was three gods at the same time? There was the father who was God and there was the Son who was God and the Holy Spirit was God and it wasn't three gods, it was one God. How this exactly was supposed to work out, I could uh, 
never figure out and I could never understand exactly how this was exactly supposed to operate. And the usual response that I got when I inquired about it was that, um, well, you know, you better believe it or you're going to go to hell, uh, which was not a very satisfactory answer. I think this led me, you know, my dissatisfaction with uh, these teachings of Christianity. Also, many of the particular practices and teachings of the Roman Catholic Church I did not like and I found very uncomfortable and uh, I didn't like it. Confession was one of them. You know, why did I have to go and confess my sins to some priest and you know, say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned and tell him a long list of all the bad things that I've done all day. It was just, why did I have to tell him? Why couldn't I just go and ask God straight? You know? And the reply was that, well, if you ask God, you know, you, you know, he might listen to you, he might not listen to you. That's why you have to come to us. And I just thought it was a big espionage, a big spy thing, so that they could catch us out and, uh, you know, and uh, keep us under control. I, I mean, really, there was other things, but I mean, to go into all of them will take a long time. But this was one stage of my questioning that began. The other stage was that, of course, I was brought up in a very, uh, how can I say, you know, normal, middle-class uh, environment where we were basically taught that money is the most important thing and that uh, uh, status and particular manners and a particular way of behaving and uh, conforming to social certain, uh, certain social norms was what was important. Um, and this is something else I just could not figure out. I mean, I used to think that I used to be there at this school, this boarding school, thinking, what am I doing here? You know, why am I here? Why do I have to sit for these exams and do this homework? And uh, all I could think was, yes, I'm here, so I can get good results, so I can go to a good university, so I can get good results, so I can get a good job, so I can make enough money to send my kids back to the same school so they could get good results, so they could go to a good university, so they could get a job and make enough money to send. And I envisaged this endless chain of this going on, and I thought, this is absolutely absurd. Is this the purpose of life? Is this why I'm here? Is this what it's all about? I couldn't accept that this was the purpose of life. And that led me to a search through many different religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, you know, the, what they call the New Age philosophies of, you know, psychosomatic yoga and, uh, you know, the, all this type of stuff. And um, full range of, I could say, say religious and semi-religious experiences. I was really trying to find some answers for everything. So this was how my uh, thinking process was developing. At the same time, I was living in Egypt, and I was very much impressed by what I had seen there, of particularly our cook. I can't remember anyone else that struck me particularly, but our cook was a very humble and simple man and uh, used to perform these prayers that I used to watch him doing as I was a young child, as he would bow and prostrate in the kitchen on his prayer mat. And it just fascinated me that he was this very simple man uh, performing these beautiful prayers. And then I would go back to this monastery and to the church and the singing and the incense and the mass and the benediction and all of that and uh, all of the uh, hullabaloo that went on. And, you know, this comparison was forming in my mind that you know, both these people claim to believe in God, both these people claim to worship Him, both these people claim to... Do, you know, that what is important is leading a life of simplicity and humility and, and humbleness before God. But it was clear to me which one was actually achieving that. And that was the our cook. His name was Ibrahim. May Allah have mercy on him. So this was one thing. The other thing is that someone, I mean, in 10 years in Egypt, only one person ever talked to me about Islam. Even he didn't really talk to me about Islam. He talked to me more about Christianity. And anyway, after this long conversation that went on for about 45 minutes, him asking me about Jesus and the Trinity and what do you believe? And then I was trying to explain to him about all of these, not really understanding it myself. And uh, at the end of it, he said, look, so you believe Jesus is God? I said, yes, Jesus is God. He said, and you believe Jesus died on the cross? Yes, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He said, so you believe God died? And you know, when he said that, I just, I was dumbfounded. I didn't know. I never thought of that before. I never put it together. You know, there was the equation in front of me, but I'd never added it up. He did it for me, and I was 
struck that, well, you know, of course God can't die. You, could, you can't kill God. You can't put God on a cross. If you can do that, he's not God. He said, so you believe God died? You know, when he said that, I just, I was dumbfounded. I didn't, I never thought of that before. I never put it together. You know, there was the equation in front of me, but I'd never added it up. He did it for me, and I was struck that, well, you know, of course God can't die. You, could, you can't kill God. You can't put God on a cross. If you can do that, he's not God. But I wasn't ready to admit, you know, in front of him that, you know, well, you're right. I just, uh, that took a long, lot longer. But uh, after, you know, several years of thinking and more reading, and really I could say spirit experiencing a lot of things and changes in my life, uh, the ultimate thing that really persuaded me was um, reading a translation of the Qur'an. When I read this translation of the Qur'an, I was immediately convinced that uh, this was not the work of any man, and that if I have ever, ever read a book that was from God, this was the book. And it was from that moment that I really entered into the religion of Islam, although to actually start practicing it and implementing it in my life took a lot longer. This social transformation in terms of your family and friends, yes. how did they react to, the, especially at the college level? Yes. Uh, that's a yes. peer group. And at a elderly level, parents level. Well, my friends, I mean, the, the interesting thing is that when I actually started practicing Islam, I started praying, I started fasting, I, you know, I, I stopped eating, I stopped drinking alcohol, and you know, there was a stage when I actually began to practice the religion. Before, you know, there was a period of time when I said, yes, I'm a Muslim, I believe in the Quran, and people would go, yes, yes, that's good, have another drink, you know. And, you know, no one, take, no one cares, you can say anything. But when you actually start practicing, when I actually started practicing, the reaction was, um, you know, you, you know who your friends are. You know who your friends are. And uh, the reaction of some of them was, you know, that, that's, what, that's fine. If it's fine for you, it's no problem with us. And the other was, you know, the other reaction was very negative. So there was some good and some bad. But with my parents in the beginning, it was not good. It was not good. Partly because I was very, I could say, zealous in the way I was talking to them about Islam because the joy of becoming Muslim, I wanted to convey it to them, but what happened is it was, became in an overzealous way. And I remember a conversation that I had with my mother at this time when I'd just become Muslim. She, she was saying, because I was so enthusiastic, and she said, I think you need to go and see a psychiatrist. I said, listen, mum, you're the one who says one God plus one God plus one God equals one God. I think you need to go and see a psychiatrist. So uh, after that uh, incident, my mother came knocking on the door, I think it was the next day, and uh, announced that I had been taken out of the inheritance, you know, and uh, we've told our solicitor to strike you from the inheritance, and uh, I was on my own, and uh, you wouldn't be getting any of our money type thing. So I, you know, alhamdulillah, I didn't mind. And, uh, really, I had trust in Allah, and I knew that Allah would look after me and care for me. But alhamdulillah, you know, many years on, my parents have seen that how Islam has transformed my life and how Islam has made me a infinitely better person and uh, responsible and uh, caring and even towards them in a way that I never was before. And uh, although they haven't become Muslim, I think they have a lot of respect uh, for me and uh, for the fact that I follow Islam and we have a good relationship now, alhamdulillah. Now do you feel if you were to talk to your mother now Yes. You would do in a much more caring, because you have had so many years of experience of Islam. Yes, yes. Then when you said you had an overzealous approach. Would um, you, would you I don't talk to my mother about Islam anymore unless she brings the subject up. Because, you know, my attitude is that I think I've tried everything. I've given books, I've given videos, I've, uh, you know, I, I've had my zealous stage. I thought I reached the stage when there's not much more I can do short of giving a good example, letting her see how I am, what my life is like. And she knows what, uh, you know, there's not much more I can tell her. And I reached the stage that I felt that if I tried to tell her anything else, it will just make her go in the opposite direction. So if she asks me a question,
And if my father asks me a question, I will answer that question because once they have asked, their obligation is to listen. Okay? But I'm not going to try and shove anything down their throats because I feel it is counterproductive. And that's how every Muslim should be. You know, we're only going to talk to people when there's going to be an advantage in it. You have had a practical experience first on the Dawa front as well as on Isla. Could you briefly outline for our viewers the definition as well as the practical experience of Dawa and Isla, their differences and their importance? When you're talking to a non-Muslim, uh, the most important thing, the most important thing is the issue of Tawheed. The issue of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This we know from the Quran, we know from the seerah, and we know from the teaching of the Sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. And the examples of that are too many. Just for example, when the Prophet, ﷺ, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, sent Mu'ad ibn Jabal to Yemen, he said, Oh Mu'ad, you're going to the people of the book. So the, let the first thing you call them be is to the worship of Allah. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the, the meaning of which in his book. You know, all people of the book, let us come to a common terms between us and you. And the common terms that we're told to come between us and you is that we should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And indeed, for the first 13 years of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he fundamentally and primarily concerned himself only with these issues of fundamental issues of aqeedah concerning the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the akhirah before any of the rules and the regulations of Islam were revealed. So all of this teaches us that fundamentally the most important issue to deal with with the non-Muslim is this issue of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, believing in him, his messengers, his books. Whereas with the Muslim, although sometimes unfortunately uh, today in the Muslim world we have many Muslims or people who call themselves Muslims who have failed to even understand Tawheed. So sometimes the barrier, the difference between Dawah and Islam is not that distinct anymore because sometimes we have to call people who say they are Muslims back to the fundamentals. But generally otherwise you'll find that... Can, uh, can, mm. can, I inter uh, can yes. you uh, describe for us some of the unpleasant experiences you well, would have with Muslim, uh, Muslims in the context of the statement yes. of uh, George Bernard Shaw. Yes. He made a statement, yeah. uh, Islam is the best, yes. Muslims are the worst. One important yes. statement he made. Another statement he had yeah. made was, if any religion Yes. that can conquer Europe in the next hundred years, it can yes. only be Islam. Yes. In this context, I want you to first mm. relate to us your disturbing experiences mm. with the Muslims, mm. as well as the pleasant experiences you might have had. Well, I, think, I, mean, I, I told you something about our cook, you know, Ibrahim, and you know, I, I mean, I had many pleasant experiences with him, and generally uh, in Egypt, living in Egypt, um, my experience was good that they're extremely friendly, extremely kind. And one thing I love, very laid back, in the sense that, um, not in a bad way, as people often imagine Muslims to be fatalistic. You know, when they say, inshallah, everything's in the hands of Allah. Many Westerners imagine that Muslims are fatalistic, that everything is in the hands of fate, and I'm going to sit on my chair, and you know, whatever Allah wills is going to happen. Muslims are not like that, and that's not what Islam teaches. But what is beautiful is, that they don't spend all their life worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow and killing themselves over what happened before. Everything is, mashallah, inshallah, what happened was the will of Allah. And this is, gives them a freedom, a mental freedom, and a peace and a tranquility, and a sort of happiness, a, how can I say, a relaxed attitude that I found really very, very, very nice especially compared to how we find the people in the West. So the contrast was something that I found very, alhamdulillah, you know, I really found that something remarkable, apart from the kindness and the sincerity of many Muslims that I knew. But the bad experiences that I had, more, are more often actually when I came to Islam, they range from, well, what do you know anyway? You're just a new Muslim. I mean, I get this all the time. You know, I mean, this is the, uh, and it goes, the sickness goes even worse than that. As if you can't be a real Muslim unless you're a Pakistani or an Indian or a Bengali or something, some ridiculous nonsense like this, okay? Which is rubbish because every single one of the companions of the Prophet was a new Muslim. You know, every single one of them embraced Islam. 
many of the earliest scholars of Islam, including Imam Bukhari, his father, was a new Muslim. They were not born into uh, Muslim families, many of even the, some of the scholars. So this type of attitude is really, I don't know where they get it from. And this is what I find, that for many people, Islam is a culture that has something to do with the country they came from. And very rarely is it actually connected with what Allah says and what the Messenger وسلم, says. A lot of it is culture and not the actual teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is a very unpleasant to encounter this. In context mm. of your commitment to studying Islamic mm. uh, culture mm. against the aberrant Muslim culture that you spoke of, mm. what suggestions would you give to the Muslim community for people yeah. like you mm. who have a natural inclination to move towards Islam? What mm. suggestions would you do to deal with other deal people? With you are a stronger person yes. maybe. Yes. To come closer, maybe others would not be you that mean how, strongly how, attracted. How would I recommend people yes, what they deal should, with what, new Muslims? What change you would expect and what would you suggest from them? Well, to make the a Muslim first, ummah, better ummah. Well, you know, what I really suggest is that, I mean, there's, the only thing I can suggest is that Muslims learn about their religion. That's simply it. Read the Quran for yourself. Read what the Prophet wasallam said, what he taught. Read a translation that you can understand. Read a Muslim. For example, excellent collection of prophetic traditions is the book Riyad the Salihin. It's an excellent book where you can find many of the sayings of the Prophet And be very careful not to bring your culture into it. For example, I'll give you an example. This is a true story, a true story. A man once came up to a Muslim, he said, look, I love Islam. I love everything about it. I want to be a Muslim, but do I have to eat curry? Do I have to eat curry? This is what he said. Because he thought that to be a Muslim, you have to eat curry. He only ever saw these people eating curry. You know? So this is what he thought. He thought Islam was one of the things he was going to have to do was to eat curry. So, I mean, this is the problem. So we have to try not always to be presenting our culture as if it is the religion. Uh, and that's very important, I think, to make a distinction between the two. Although many times things from our culture or from the Pakistani or Indian or Bangladeshi or Arab or culture, it is from Islam. It is many yeah. times, but not always. And sometimes it is in opposition to Islam. So this is what's very important. I think this is something that we find that um, can drive people away. When Islam is presented as a cultural thing, not as something that is international for everybody, everywhere, and every time and every place. What uh, would you consider as the message of Islam for humanity in a universal context? You find a message of humanity in various other religions. Sometimes they have the limitations. Islam's message is on a universal level. So what is the most important aspects or the mm. points you have found really very interesting? I think the most... Message of humanity. The, I mean, the thing is that, that, I mean, one of the, I think, one of the great proofs, or we should say one of the great evidences, because proof is one, whereas evidences are many. One of the evidences, the clear evidences, that Islam is from the Creator, is its universality. Is the fact that the fundamental teachings of Islam, the fundamental beliefs of Islam, the fundamental aqidah, or the things that the Muslims uh, are bound upon to believe and practice, they are universal. Oh.